today I'm going to preach on the money and blessing connection. And I really want you to receive this message with an open heart. And I believe this is the right time to really preach on this. This is connected to the series on prosperity. And we really have to understand this teaching based on the whole counsel of God's Word. So it's going to be powerful. I encourage you to practice this Word also immediately after you receive this message. Amen? And I want you to not understand. You know, sometimes in Nagaland, when the church talks about money, people criticize that. If we talk about money and you have a difficulty with it, your mind needs to be renewed. Because the Bible talks a lot about money. Jesus talked a lot about money. In, in fact, he said, where your treasure is, your heart is. So money is spiritual. Amen. And we need to understand that giving is a deeply personal indicator of our spiritual maturity as well as our faith. The portion that we choose to give, it reflects our faith. It reflects our love for God. It reflects our honor for God. And that's why this message is absolutely important. Let me just read what an author had written about this. Giving is a spiritual issue. And in fact, a relational issue with God. In order to truly yield to God's ownership of our possessions, we must evaluate carefully what may be the evidence of our faith. The money that you just put in the bucket. Just as we decide on what we spend on an appliance or how much we will put in a savings or retirement account, we must also have to decide how much money we will give. Even to give nothing is a decision. And we as stewards of God are accountable for each decision to please the ultimate honor who is God himself. Many see the responsibility of giving as a burden. How sad that is in the light of Paul's reminder that God loves a cheerful giver. And giving is actually a relational decision. Because number one, a decision to give establishes our faith that we are stewards of God's resources. Number two, as we continually give, we constantly affirm how much we value our relationship to God as His children. And an amazing benefit of giving is that it releases us from the real burden of our own financial needs. As we learn to trust God through giving, we can live confidently on what is left because we know that God is taking care of that. In fact, giving is freedom, not bondage. And it connects us to God closely in relationship. The ultimate outcome is that those who give experience a sense of intimacy with God that all followers of Christ long for. Giving becomes worship. Giving becomes a way of saying thanks to God for His grace and promised provision. Giving becomes a part of a close personal connection to God. Giving connects us to the anointing and the blessing of God. Amen. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 14. And I want to establish first that all our giving must be to Christ. And in reality... It is to Christ when we give our tithes and offerings, when we give as the Holy Spirit leads, we are in reality giving to Christ. Genesis chapter 14. Now in verse 14 onwards, the Bible says, Abram, hearing that his brother Lot was taken captive, he took his 318 servants and he goes and defeats the army of King Chedorlamor and he brings back all the goods, verse 16, and all his goods, Lot's goods, as well as the women and the people. So he's coming back from battle. He has won the plunder, goods. And as he is coming back, verse 18, he meets Melchizedek, who is king of Salem, or king of Jerusalem, the city of peace. The word Salem comes from the word Shalom. So Melchizedek is also known as the king of peace. Brings out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. 
And he blessed him. Melchizedek blesses Abraham and says, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. A tithe means a tenth of all the goods that he had won in battle. Melchizedek is a priest of God Most High also the king of Salem. When Abraham meets him after the battle, Melchizedek refreshes Abraham with bread and wine, a meal in those days for kings. After that, he blesses Abraham, and he also blesses God in that prayer that we see in verse 19 and 20. Abraham recognizes that Melchizedek is a priest, a priest of God Most High, his spiritual superior, he accepts the blessing of Melchizedek and he gives him a tithe of all the goods that he wins in battle. Here we see Melchizedek playing the role of a mediator. A mediator between God and Abraham. In verse 19, he says, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High. So he's holding, in a sense, the hands of Abraham. In verse 20, he says, Blessed be God Most High. He's holding the hands of God and he's connecting Abraham to God. He is a mediator here as the priest. That's the role of the priest in the Old Testament to connect the people to God, to represent the people to God. Amen. Melchizedek is a mysterious character in the testi- in the, on the Old Testament, in the Bible. It said that he is a king, king of Jerusalem, priest of God Most High, and his name, Melchizedek, also means king of righteousness. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, he is likened as Christ. Melchizedek is a type of Christ because Christ is also the king of our righteousness. Christ is also the King of kings and the Prince of our peace. Amen. Christ is a high priest forever. Hallelujah. So Christ is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Christ refreshes us with his bread, with the blood, and the broken body. The bread and the wine which we just partook. Jesus is the one who connects us to God and connects God to us. So here, Melchizedek is a type of Christ. In fact, some scholars say this is really an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Now, I want you to look to Hebrews chapter 7. In verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who made Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days, no end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Christ is an eternal high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And the verses go on to talk about how when Abraham gave him tithes, in fact, Levi, who was in Abraham's Lawrence also gave tithes to Melchizedek. Verse 7, Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better, referring to Melchizedek blessing Abraham. Verse 8, Here, now this is the important part, Here, on the earth, in the church, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Now, this is what we understand as we read the story, Melchizedek being a type of Christ. When we give to the church, we are really giving to Christ. Amen. When we give to Christ, we are giving to God. Melchizedek connected Abraham and God. Abraham wanted to give honor and thanks to God for all that he won on the battlefield. His offering to God was really received by Melchizedek. Or in other words, when Abraham gave to Melchizedek, he was actually giving to God. And Melchizedek 
was being the mediator in that regard. Here, we give to the church. But the church is really the body of Christ. But when men receive your tithes here, the officers of this church, there, Christ is receiving your tithes. When Christ receives your tithes and your offerings and your giving, it is God who is receiving it. Amen. Hallelujah. So your giving, predominantly of our finances, is really connecting us to God. Amen. And so we must understand this. Every time we give, we must give as if we are giving to Christ. All our giving must be to Christ. Now, there are different types of giving. You give your tithes and your offerings to the church. We give to the orphans. We give to the poor. We give to charity. Amen. We give to men and women of God. There are different types of giving in Scripture. But all giving must be to Christ. All giving must be to Christ because it is only when we give to Christ we are assured that we are giving to God and we are assured that there is a connection being made and a blessing being released into our lives. Now that would mean that we must learn to give by the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. We must learn to give into how Christ is inspiring us in the different expressions of Christ. For example, Jesus also said, as much as you do it unto the least of this, you do it unto me. Some of you have been going to the homes of the poor in our church in the Christmas giving campaign, and you have been giving to the poor in those homes. Now, when you go, I don't want you to go with a sense of pity. I feel so sad. They have nothing to eat. No. I want you to go with a sense of honor and the sense of faith. Pity giving has no blessing. Every time you give, whether you give to the orphans, you give to the poor, you are giving to Christ. That is our faith. We're giving to Christ. Amen. So every time we give, we must give in faith looking to God, not looking to the person. Not in emotion, not in pity. We give in honor as if we are giving to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'll explain more as we go along. Let me give you three examples of this. First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17, verse 8. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Elijah was in the brook. The ravens were bringing him food in the morning and in the evening, and he was drinking by the brook. By this time, Israel was experiencing famine. There was no rain by the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar, and see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. Elijah is telling her, Give to me first. In the midst of your lack. See what I taught you last Sunday? You must know what is seed and you must know what is food. Amen. And bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. Now this is the promise, verse 14. The bin of flour shall not be dried up, used up, nor shall a jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, 
according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah. How long was this? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, the bin of flour did not dry up. The oil did not run dry. In times of famine, food is wealth. Amen. I don't apologize for teaching prosperity because I know I teach biblical prosperity. I teach true prosperity. Many people criticize what they call the prosperity gospel, not understanding what the Word of God says. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let's look at this. This was a woman who was a believer in the true God. She had serious financial needs herself. When the prophet comes to her, she's asked to part with what she has, the very little that she has, in the moment of a crisis, and give it as a seed to the man of God, into his ministry, the prophetic ministry of Elijah. Amen. She hears God's promise that if she will give her, her bin of flour, the jar of oil will not run dry till the time the famine does not stop. So she obeys the word of God and gives obediently. She honors the word that comes from the man of God. And God is faithful to his word by providing to her needs miraculously for three and a half years. Amen. Her giving connected her to the blessing of God. What well, she gave, she did not give to God directly in a sense. She gave to a man of God. She gave into his ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes when there is an opportunity for giving that has been presented, really, that is an opportunity from God to bring blessings into our lives. If we will truly understand what God wants to do in our lives. Amen. And we have to have a positive attitude in the different opportunities of giving that are presented before us as we pray and seek the Lord. The giving connected her to the blessing of God. The giving connected her to the supply of God. The giving connected her to the resource of God. Hallelujah. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. Now it happened one day that Elisha, who was a prophet after Elijah, went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman. So she was a woman of substance, well known in the society. The Bible says she was a great woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. <clears throat> and she said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. So not only was she prosperous and great, but she also had spiritual discernment. She was a woman of God, and she could recognize the anointing upon this man. She could recognize that this man was not just a traveler, that this man was not just, in a sense, a pastor, a preacher, someone who's serving the Lord in full-time ministry, but there was a special gift upon this man, that this man is a prophet. And so she wanted to supply the needs, the personal needs of this man of God. And she speaks to her husband, please let us make a small upper room on the wall. And let us put a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand, so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Her desire was to take care of the personal need of the man of God. The personal needs. A bed, a table, a lampstand. Something that will minister to his body, refresh and strengthen him as he's traveling from place to place in the ministry. Even this is a ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I want you to notice this here. She receives him as a prophet. 
She honors him as a prophet, not as a beggar. In Nagaland, I've seen so many times people giving to pastors and evangelists as if they are beggars. They give, yes, but the attitude is Morombiase Didibina. There is no blessing in that kind of giving. You don't give to a beggar, you are giving into the anointing that is on that man. I'll explain more later. But anyway, let me just come straight to it. Jesus Christ, Christos, what does it mean? The anointed one. When you are giving, I'll give you a secret. If you really want to connect to the blessing and see results in your giving, learn to discern the anointing of Christ as you give. Learn to discern the anointing of Christ. Why? Because we want to give to Christ. We don't want to just give wherever there's a need. We don't want to just give emotionally. We don't want to give just because our flesh is being pulled. Because as you know, in Nagaland, there are hundreds of associations, village groups, youth groups, colony groups, clan groups, and so on. Everyone is coming for money. We are connected not only to one church, village church, colony church, this church, that church. Where do we give? Many times we just give because it's socially acceptable. But if we will look and understand the scripture, the only giving that, we, that will bring a blessing in your life is when you give to Christ. How do I give to Christ? Because I don't see him physically. So now we have to recognize how Christ comes to us. The church, the body of Christ, is the primary vehicle, how Christ comes to us. But you have to see the church more than just as an organization or a name. You have to see the anointing upon the church. It's always blessed to give to a church where Christ is moving than to a church where Christ is not moving as much. Amen. You have to give to Christ. How do I give to Christ? As you pray, there's an inspiration to go and give to that widow in your neighborhood. That inspiration comes from the Spirit of Christ. When you obey that, you are giving to Christ. Amen. When you give to a man of God, because you recognize the anointing upon that man. You recognize the gift upon that man. You see, all anointing is from Christ. The apostle, the pastor, the prophet, the teacher, evangelist. Christ gave people in the church to represent to the body of Christ in those fivefold ministry. The anointing came from Christ. When you recognize this man is a prophet, and he may have some irritating behavior around him. Maybe his armpit stinks. Maybe he has some eating behavior that is not very kosher. And because we look at those things, we feel like there's no point in giving him because you are fleshly. You have to perceive in the spirit. You see that this man is a man of God. This man is a prophet. This man is called of God in this area. And you see the anointing and you honor that. And as you give into that, there is a blessing there. Amen. Hallelujah. So this man, this woman recognizes that Elisha is a prophet. She recognizes the anointing upon this man. And she gives to meet his personal needs. Verse 11. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call the Shunammite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. I mean, she was feeding him. She was providing for his mattress, bed sheet, water on his table. She was serving this man of God. 
And he says, what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually she has no son and her husband is old. So he said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. Amen. Her giving connected her to the anointing that was upon this man. And her giving was the bridge on which the blessing came into her life. She became fruitful. They increased. What is that? That is prosperity. To have children, that is prosperity. Amen. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 to 42, the Bible says that when we honor a prophet in the name of a prophet, we receive a prophet's reward. When we honor a believer, even a believer, by recognizing Christ upon them, there is a reward there. He who receives me, and he who receives me, receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man. How many righteous men do we have here? Can I see your hands? All the righteous, put up your hands. What about the rest of you? Are you a believer? then you are righteous. All the righteous lift up your hands. Amen. The Bible says, when you honor a righteous man, make sure you're honoring the person sitting next to you. When you honor a righteous man, in the name of a righteous man, you shall receive a righteous man's reward. Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, even a brand new believer, if you will honor them, Assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. This is talking about honor. Honor is high esteem. Honor is respect. Honor is reverence. Honor is receiving a person well. Honor also includes giving. When you honor a prophet, recognizing the gift and the anointing of a prophet, you shall receive a prophet's reward in the case of this woman. Different types of giving. Tithes, offering, we give to the missions, we give to the poor, we give to widows, we give to missions, we give to pastors, leaders, men of God. We give as the Spirit leads into other causes. But in all of those givings, be mindful to be giving to Christ. Look for Christ. How do I look for Christ? Ah, look for life. Life. There must be this life, this life that comes from your spirit in your giving. That means when you're giving, you should look for that peace, that joy, because that is the life of Christ within you. Christ is life. Christ is the tree of life. When you are giving, but there is, ah, there's a death. There is no peace, but people are pressurizing you to give. Your community, your tribe is pressurizing you to give, and you are being compelled to give, but in your spirit, it's like, ah, it's like, no, it's like, no, it's like a death feeling. Anyone ever experienced that? You feel death. Don't give. Don't give. There is no blessing in that giving. In Nagaland, we really need this teaching. I didn't give even to my own village church. There was no life. But pastor, your own village, your own tribe. My money belongs to Christ. It doesn't belong to my village. It doesn't belong to my tribe. Come on. We have to be free from the bondage of tribe and village and even denomination. It belongs to Christ. There was pressure to give. I felt no life. It was death. 
the Spirit of God within me was going, eh. So I didn't give. Doesn't matter what people say. See, the village cannot bless me. Amen. When I need to buy a new car, the village is not going to take up an offering on my behalf. When I need to buy a new car, Christ is going to provide for me. Amen. Hallelujah. For my retirement, I'm looking to Christ. So I give to Christ. How do I give to Christ? I look for how Christ comes to me. How? I look for life. What life? The life of the Spirit in the opportunities of giving. I'm sensitive to my heart. I'm sensitive. Like the time when we gave to the missionaries that came from Laos, as I'm sitting, that my spirit is going, whew, give them 5,000 rupees. It just came from my spirit. I recognize it. This is Christ. And we gave them 5,000 rupees because I was giving to Christ. Within a few days, we received 50,000 rupees. Hallelujah. Amen. Learn to give to Christ. Hallelujah. Numbers 18, verse 8. Put it up in the King James Version. Numbers 18, verse 8. And so, when we talk about Christ, even giving is not a formula. Otherwise, if you, if you receive this message in the flesh, what you're going to say is, all right, I will give and I will get. No, you won't. It's not a formula. It comes out of relationship. How do, I, how do I see Christ coming to me in various forms? Relationship, spending time with Christ. Amen. Numbers 18 verse 8 in the King James. King James. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, let me read for you. Behold, I also have given thee the charge of mine heave offerings of all the hallowed things, Hello things means holy things of the children of Israel. Unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing. By reason of the anointing and to thy sons by an ordinance forever. The anointing of the priest was upon Aaron and his sons. And the offerings of the heave, the wave offerings, belong to Aaron and his children. This is the point here. We don't give to a church, a ministry, or a man of God because he lacks. Because they lack. When we give because, you're treating them as a beggar. Amen. You must understand this. Don't give simply out of self-pity. <laughs> you must give by looking to the anointing by reason of the anointing because we recognize the anointing upon them now in many cases they may not have but when you see that they don't have don't give out of a feeling of pity you recognize the anointing the calling upon them and give because if you are moved by what you see, it is very easy for people to also dress up shabbily and come to you and pull on your emotions. Some people are very smart in that. They're very smart. I like to dress prosperous. Amen. Dress the way God blesses me. Amen. So sometimes people may look some, at someone like me and say, ah, he, he, that'll be, he has little child, be. <laughs> he has plenty, no need to give him. Let's give to someone who has no shoes, who's wearing chapels. And you end up being led by your eyes. Amen. You must see the anointing when you give. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. When he gone into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. 
a fisherman's boat. It represents wealth. The time that he could have spent fishing, Jesus asked, or in a sense, Jesus rented it for a few minutes or maybe a couple of hours so that Jesus can teach the multitudes. So Jesus asks Peter for the use of his boat so that he can teach. Verse 4, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and the net was breaking. So they signaled to the partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. How would you like God to bless you so much that you begin to sink? Amen. Hallelujah. Here we see another example of how the giving connects to the blessing. Fish to a fisherman is money. Fish to a fisherman is increase, it's wealth. How did Peter experience this blessing in his life? Because Peter gave his boat to Jesus for a few hours. So that Jesus can use it for the preaching of the gospel. Amen. In return, there was a blessing that came back into his life and even into his business and even into his friends. Your giving connects you to the blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's why we must understand this in faith. That giving is not a burden. Giving is not something that is forced upon us. Giving is really God giving us opportunity to connect with Him and receive increased blessings upon our lives. It is seed. If you look at all of these cases, all of them gave willingly. God loves the cheerful giver. All of them gave to a man that they could see. They gave to Elijah, gave to Elisha, gave to Peter. Now, when you are giving to God, we don't like, you know, go to temples or places like idols as some other people do, and we give an offering to that idol. We don't do that, do we? How do we give to God? We give to somebody. There's always somebody on the earth that will receive your gift to God. There's always a mediator. Now, the mediator is Christ. Christ is the one who connects us to God. But Christ doesn't come personally to collect the tithes and the offerings. So Christ mediates your giving and Him through the church. The church is the body of Christ. So when you're giving to the church, you're giving to Christ. Here, the ushers are receiving. There, He receives your tithes. Amen. Hallelujah. When the Holy Spirit inspires you to go and give to the orphans, you're giving to God. You're giving to Christ. Even though you're giving to them. Why? Every time you give to God on the earth, there is somebody here that will receive it. That will receive it. We don't give to God like this, do we? <laughs> Just throw it up in the air. Here, God, receive my tithes. Since you didn't take it, I'm going to use it anyway for myself. <laughs> no, we don't do that. We always give to somebody here. When God leads you to give, even honor your father and your mother, which is the Word of God. Honoring includes giving. Do you know that when you give to your mother by the leading of the Spirit, you're giving to Christ? You're giving to God? There's something good 
even from the culture of other religions that we must learn when they honor the father and mother. Amen. You're giving to God. Hallelujah. When the Holy Spirit leads you to give to an usher, because you've seen that usher faithfully serving, but he's wearing the same white shirt that is becoming yellow shirt over these years, and you just, ah, you just felt some compassion, and you went and gave. You're giving to God. You're giving to God. If you will see that, it will change the way you give. It will make you want to give more. Who would not want to give to God? Amen. The book of Proverbs says, He that lends to the poor, no, he that gives to the poor lends to God. When you're giving to the poor, you're lending to God. If Bill Gates came and asked me, Pastor Sean, can you lend me 10,000 rupees? You know what I would say? Take 20. Take 50 also. Why? Because I know it's going to come back with interest. Because I'm giving to the richest man on the earth. He that gives to the poor is lending to... Ah, let me say that again. He that gives to the poor is lending... How many of you would like to lend to God? Amen. So when you are going to those 35 homes this month... Give generously. Go and bless them out of their socks. Go and just overwhelm them so much that even when they are grandfathers, they will be speaking to their grandchildren. 30 years back, this man came from Faith Harvest Church. And he blessed us so much. Wouldn't that be history? Amen. Bless them out of the socks. If you have given them something already last week, go again this week. <laughs> Surprise them again and say, hey, I'm back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. They were really giving to God. All of them, even though the woman was giving to Elijah, she was giving to God. Amen. When you give, you are giving to God because the giving connects you to their anointing. The giving connects you to the power. The giving connects you to the blessing. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. The Bible also says, give to the man of God. Giving to men and women of God who are serving in the ministry is giving. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I don't say this because I want your giving, but I'm saying this because you need this teaching. There's a blessing in giving to men and women of God who are in the ministry. Hallelujah. And you need to know this, and you need to practice this I'm not saying that's only for me or for the pastors of our church. Wherever God takes you in the future, when you see a man and a woman of God that God is using, God impresses on your heart. Or even if there is no real strong impression, you just see and recognize that this is a man of God. You give. You honor. There is a blessing there. It's the Word of God. Who is taught the Word, share in all good things. 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 Don't just come up and say, I was so blessed, I'll be praying for you, Pastor. <laughs> Sharing all good things. Things. <laughs> Everyone said things. Things with Him who teaches. Hallelujah. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Now, this is the context of giving and blessing people who teach. So, the context is really about giving. Verse 8, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now, what does this mean? I believe this is how we can also apply this verse. He who sows to his flesh, 
The preposition to in the Greek is the word E-I-S, I-S, which really means into, not to, but into. So the Bible is saying, don't sow into the flesh, because when you're sowing into the flesh, you will reap corruption. In other words, you're giving, there is no blessing. You're giving, but it's fleshly, and there is no harvest there. What is fleshly giving? Fleshly giving is emotional giving. When you're just moved by emotions and pity, you're moved by your eyes, what you see, what you hear, and you give. You're moved by pressure and manipulation. There is no reward there. In other words, you're giving, but it's decaying. Your seed decays. The Bible says here, he who sows into the Spirit, in other words, when you are giving, give into the Spirit. Recognize the anointing of Christ, the leading of Christ, the Spirit of Christ into the different opportunities that you have to give. And he who sows into the Spirit will reap everlasting life. In other words, there is a fruit there is a blessing of Zoe, abundant life, that comes back into you when you are sowing into the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Learn to sow into the Spirit. Learn to see and recognize where God is moving, where the Holy Spirit is moving, whom God is using mightily, who is flowing and moving with the Spirit of God, and sow into that. Hallelujah. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul gives a promise to the church at Philippi. Verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So the church at Philippi were supporting the ministry of Paul. Paul's church planting ministry was supported by the church at Philippi. They were sending me aid. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not just once, once and again. They were partners. They were regular givers into the ministry of Paul. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Paul is saying, there's a fruit that comes to you when you give to me. How shameful of Paul. Sarombinai. For to preach in Korea. That's the way we will perceive it in Nagaland. Paul is saying, when you're sending aid to me, there's fruit that's coming to you. I'm not seeking your money, but when you give, there's blessing that comes to you. That's what Paul is saying. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. A sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Hallelujah. Your giving is sacrifice. Money is spiritual. You know why? Because that money, it represents time, our talent, ability that you give to the government or you give to your employer for a month. Your month. You have given your time, your effort, your energy for a month to that company, and a company calculates one month of your life is equal to 20,000 rupees. <laughs> one month of your life is equal to 50,000 rupees. So in monetary terms, it represents your life. So you are taking it, and you're bringing it home. And then you calculate 10% of it, and you're bringing it to the church. In other words, when you're giving your tithes, what you're saying to God is, I honor you with my life. I'm giving you my life. My life. It's a sacrifice. Every time you give, it's a sacrifice. And that sacrifice, when it's from the heart, when it's from faith, when it is sincere, 
out of love for God, it's a sweet smelling aroma unto the Lord. And the promise is this, verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That is a promise to those that give. My God shall supply all your need. Shall supply all your need. All your need. All your need. All. All. You have needs this Christmas. Trust in the Lord. Sow seed. Don't eat your seed. Amen. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches. Not according to the economy of Nagaland. Not according to how the government gives bonuses. Not according to the government's pockets. Business kidney was hey, government could build release corona, market kali. So we think that according to the government, we are blessed. No, we are blessed according to his riches. Can you say amen? In glory by Christ Jesus. You see, you must understand this. Giving in faith provokes the anointing. It provokes the anointing, it stirs up the anointing on your behalf. When Isaac knew that it was time for him to release the blessing, the blessing upon Esau, which was taken by Jacob, you know what Isaac said? Go and hunt for me. Bring me game. And cook for me savory meal that I may eat of it. And then I will bless you. Giving provokes the anointing. This was not just a father and a son talking about what the father likes. Isaac was talking to his children in the spirit. You see this principle throughout the scriptures. Giving provokes the anointing. When you give your full-hearted attention to me when I preach, you know what? It provokes the anointing of teaching to increase. The Holy Spirit within me will teach more and bring forth more revelation. If you will give your attention, if you will honor the Word, the wisdom you're looking for in your life is in the preaching. If you will honor the presence of the Holy Spirit, you will honor the man of God, the anointing upon him, and you listen and you give your whole heart, the Holy Spirit within him will stir up the anointing and he will say things he never thought about saying. He will say things he never planned to say. It will come out and that is your key and your wisdom for your life. But if you don't understand that, you will come and twiddle on your thumbs, play on your mobile phones during the preaching. The time of preaching is the most important time of your week. It's not just a sermon. This is, this is your engagement with God. When I stand here, it's not me. I'm standing representing Christ and His anointing. I'm mediating between you and God. But don't come and touch my feet after the service is over. But understand, I'm mediating between you and God because the anointing is on me when I'm preaching and teaching. Christ always comes to us in various forms. And we will be sitting in church and we will be criticizing the speaker and saying, Ki babi aze? and then we want God. God, where are you? <laughs> you see, you're rejecting Christ. At that moment, I'm not saying you go to hell, <laughs> but I'm saying at that moment, you have not been taught to look at Christ. If you will understand this, I tell you, it will change the way you live your life of faith. So when you're listening to the Word, and you're listening, and you're taking notes, you see, the anointing increases. The Holy Spirit will begin to inspire me to speak utterance that you need for your life, a wisdom. A key. How? When you honor, when you give your heart, when you're giving your faith, when you're giving your honor to the message, it provokes the anointing. Amen. I'm telling you the truth. 
This is deep. You have to have a spiritual heart to understand this teaching. He who has ears, let him have understanding too. <laughs> when somebody comes and says, Pastor, will you pray for me? All right, I'm going to pray for you. But with all sincerity, they go down on their knees and say, I'm ready to receive. You know what? It provokes the anointing. I've literally experienced it. I'm not ready to prophesy. I don't want to pray for anyone. Someone comes with all their heart and they get on their knees. And when I'm praying, I can sense the anointing flow out of me in prophecy. And I'm speaking over their lives. I never planned to do it. You know why? The giving provokes the anointing. Is this works? It's not works. It's grace. If you look at it, at it as works, you will look at, look at it as a formula. Or oh, I don't know. If, if I give, I will get. If I give, I will get. No, it's not that. It's not a formula. It's grace. What is grace? You have seen how much Christ has done for you. You have seen his everlasting love. You know how much he loves you. On the cross, he has forgiven you. On the cross, he has made you righteous. You are so full of the riches of Christ's grace in your heart that you want to give out of love. It's a grace flow in your heart. It's not works. It's a grace flow. In other words, you want to give because you love. You want to give because you honor. It's not giving because you want to get. You're not giving to get. You're giving to love Him. You're giving to honor Him. But how? The church, the man of God, the orphans. You are giving. As you're giving, you're giving by grace to honor God. And when you're giving by grace, there's more grace that flows back to you. And you love that. Oh, I, I was so blessed when I give. Let me give more. It's more grace. And when you give more to God, there's more grace that flows back to you. Amen. Hallelujah. How can I access more grace? You give. It provokes the anointing. Amen. Do not muzzle the ox when it treads the grain. I went in churches where they want me to preach the whole day. They want me to lay hands on everyone. But in the end, we have nothing to give you. Just please take this souvenir. I don't serve because of money. I'm blessed to do it. But they don't understand. They want to take the anointing. without understanding how that anointing is not for me. I cannot produce the anointing. I cannot produce the wisdom. I cannot produce the prophecy. I cannot produce the healing. There is nothing in me. Amen. But they can do something that provokes the anointing. Come in faith. There are people who call me for revival meetings. When I go there, I'm like wondering, did they really want revival? Because there's nothing in the program that has room for revival. Special numbers, this, this. Finally, a small portion at the end. Pastor, now we're ready for revival. I'm like, you don't want revival? So, see, they don't know how to provoke the anointing. How can I just produce revival? I can't. I need revival myself. <laughs> oh, man. Hallelujah. But if we will make room in our life by honoring, recognizing, discerning, give. Like this woman made room for the prophet. When she made room for the prophet, the prophet's anointing came with him. Amen. Hallelujah. So our lifestyle of faith, our giving, our reverence, our honor towards one another, towards the body of Christ, towards how Christ comes to us in various forms. It provokes the blessing to flow back into our lives. Hallelujah. 
Amen. May you have wisdom and understanding to put this to practice this coming week. Don't let this be just a message.